Hello, Sarah here. Thank you so much for listening to AJFF In Conversation, the Jewish Film Podcast. My co-host Brad and I and everyone at the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival are so grateful for your support. Whether you've subscribed already in your podcast app of choice or are leaving us ratings and reviews, every little bit helps. What perhaps helps more than anything, though, is your financial support. We cannot do the podcast or any of our other virtual programs without the generous contributions of listeners like you. If you are willing and able, please consider supporting the podcast by making a donation at ajff.org slash in conversation. Thank you so much. And now please enjoy the episode. Hi, I'm Sarah Glassberg. I'm Brad Pilcher. And this is AJFF In Conversation, the Jewish film podcast. This week is Thanksgiving, believe it or not, and for many of us, it may feel very different than in a typical year. For sure. I myself usually travel back up to New York to see my family, but this year I am opting to stay home with my husband and my cat and maybe some good movies. I think that's how many people will be celebrating. I hope, just a reminder, that the CDC recommends you not travel for Thanksgiving. And it was with that in mind that we wanted to catch up on uh, talking about what films to watch from the What to Watch article on AJFF.org. Yes. As a reminder, every month on AJFF.org, there is a feature letting folks know what Jewish-themed titles are coming to streaming platforms, Blu-ray, and DVD, And we are actually going to be recapping both October and November picks. Of course, that's not all that we have in store for this Thanksgiving-themed episode. That's right. We figured with the world feeling so topsy-turvy this holiday season and really the whole year, it's really easy to dwell on the negative. So it might be nice to reflect on the good that 2020 gave us, specifically in the world of Jewish film and television. So we will be highlighting a couple of our personal picks for Jewish film and television moments that we are personally thankful for from this year. And it honestly was a pretty good year in that respect. But before we get to that, we should give people some recommendations for what to watch, maybe over the long holiday weekend when not on Zoom with their loved ones. Brad, what jumped out at you from the past couple what to watch articles? Well, first up, I am a huge World War II nut. I've always been a fan of World War II history. So there were two films that um, that are available on demand, on streaming, that I immediately took to. One is called A Call to Spy. It's um, available for rent, um, Amazon, YouTube, take your pick. It's a historical drama. It's actually based on true stories. It follows the Special Operations Executive, SOE, which Churchill uh, recruited to train women as spies, and they were going to go and conduct sabotage and build a resistance in Europe. It is a fascinating history that I've read about. Um, This one actually has a great cast. Um, It has three women uh, as spy mistresses, (laughs) uh, is what they were called, I think. Um, Interestingly enough, one of the characters is uh, an American with a wooden leg. There is an Indian Muslim pacifist, which you wouldn't necessarily expect. But again, this is all based on true stories. And they go into France and they help to undermine the Nazi regime. And it's just, I love spy movies. I love World War II history. So for me, that was a big one. Um, Also in the World War II vein is The Liberator, which is on Netflix now. This is actually an animated series. It debuted on Veterans Day, and it's based on the book The Liberator. It's it's a 500-day odyssey of a World War II soldier. Um, So it's a four-part series. It follows um, an infantry regiment um, uh, from Oklahoma. They fight through Europe. They liberate Italy. They go to France. They go to Germany. It's just fascinating. It's um, And it's animated, which is also something that you don't get a lot of World War II animation. Um, So for me, this has been a little bit of a boon. I am in my happy place with spy films and World War II films and even a little bit of animation thrown in. Those two in particular really jumped out at me. What about you? Yeah, well, I'm definitely interested in seeing both of those. I love the, the unique aspects of each. You mentioned that Call to Spy, it's this women-centered story that we don't get a lot on film. I feel like we get a lot of that in novels. Um, and then, of course, the the next one you mentioned, having animation. Uh, I'm very excited about those. But what I was going to mention is another Netflix um, 
release called The Life Ahead. So speaking of sort of female icons, uh, Sophia Loren is in this, um, and she's directed by her son in an adaptation of uh, Roman Gary's novel, and I'm probably butchering the the pronunciation there, um, but the novel is called The Life Before Us, and I know that that's also, he's a novelist who we've had film adaptations of his work in AJFF before, and I've heard a lot of buzz about this film, just from people in our community, um, on various <laughs> Zoom calls and such, people are really buzzing about this title. Uh, the story follows an aging Holocaust survivor who forges a bond with a young immigrant from Senegal who recently robbed her. Um, And it's got this newcomer co-star as the troubled child. um, And and they are already receiving quite a lot of early praise for for that performance. So my my pick is on Netflix, The Life Ahead. It's a really interesting premise. And I... Like I have flashbacks to other films um, I'm, I'm, uh, that have sort of had a similar premise of like somebody tries to rob you or someone's trying to like squat in your apartment or whatever. And then you find a way to befriend them in these sort of interracial tones and, and tropes. And they're always um, they're always very heartwarming and you feel very warm and fuzzy kind of coming out of them. But it, they're not warm and fuzzy films, if that makes sense. They're just they they're they're very challenging and they're very deep and they're very thoughtful, but they don't feel super heavy at the same time. So the premise alone has me hooked around that film. I'm really looking forward to it. It's not all streaming, though, actually. Um, I want to point out uh, some f- uh, films that are coming to Blu-ray and DVD or actually already have come to Blu-ray and DVD that you can get for your home collection. One in particular I'm going to highlight is the exact opposite of what I just said. It is super heavy. It is super dark. It is uh, it is a classic. It is actually one of the best um, films, I think, that was made um, by this director, who is, of course, Darren Aronofsky. The film is in question is Requiem for a Dream. If you have ever watched it, you probably will never watch it again, not because it's bad, but because it is just so hard to watch. It's so heavy. It has an incredible cast. It has Ellen Burstyn playing a Jewish widow. Sarah Goldfarb, she becomes addicted to amphetamines. You've got Jared Leto, you've got Jennifer Connelly, you've got Marlon Wayans doing not a comedy. <laughs> it is a phenomenal film. It's actually based on a, a novel from 1978 um, by the same name. Darren Aronofsky adapted it. He wrote the screenplay. It's a psychological drama. There's a lot of drug addiction. There's a lot of people being debased by their addictions. Um, it is I can't really describe um, describe the film and, and tell you how good it is without also warning you that if you haven't seen it, it's not an easy watch. But it's got some incredible cinematography, some incredible acting. Um, Ellen Burstyn in particular, I think, was nominated for a slew of awards, including an Academy Award for Best Actress. It's great. If you haven't watched it, you really should at least once in your life. Just make sure that you have some alcohol nearby and that you are prepared because it's it's really hard. But it's really, really good. And I'm a huge Darren Aronofsky fan. I think his work is is great. It's it's often um, not as uh, celebrated as I think it should be. Um, people are kind of hit and miss with his later films. Um, I think they're better than most people give them credit for. But this one in particular is kind of the one that where he burst on the scene, um, and I, and I really cannot recommend it enough. It's on Blu-ray. It's on DVD. You should get it. You should put it in your collection. Requiem for a Dream. Yeah, it's one that I have been avoiding just because I've heard how intense it is. My husband, then boyfriend in college, I remember texting me from his dorm being like, I just watched this movie and I am so scarred. And of course, I'd heard of it up to that point. But I think just hearing that from him, I was like, I don't know that I'm ever going to work up the nerve to watch this movie. <laughs> but I but I but I know it's a classic, um, you know, hearing your endorsement of it and knowing that it's available now on this um in this way, maybe I should probably go seek it out finally. Um, But my pick is one that is still a little emotionally intense, but not quite in the same way. It's a film that we showed at this past year's uh, AJFF and it's called Crescendo. This was honestly one of my favorite films of the festival this past year. It's about this renowned conductor who for various personal reasons things that you find out about him and and his past and his heritage he ultimately kind of begrudgingly decides to assemble this orchestra made up of both Israeli and Palestinian youth um, musicians and it's it's just really emotional and and there are 
these moments of, you know, it's, it's about kind of building these bridges of understanding between these two groups through music, but not just through music. It's, it's really powerful. Um, the performances are amazing um, for anyone who perhaps watches a lot of German film or even films that we've had also at the festival. Um, I know there's this actor, Peter uh, Simonischek, again, even as a sort of German speaker, I might be butchering his pronunci pronunciation of his name too, but um, he's fantastic. And he was in the German um, film from Germany that was nominated for the Academy Award. I don't think it won, but um, it's called Tony Erdmann. He gives a great performance in that. He gives a great performance in this. Um, I, I can't say enough good things. And if you didn't catch it during the festival, please go seek it out on Blu-ray and DVD. It is, it is so resonant and beautiful and moving it has a great opening sequence that kind of puts you on the edge of your seat right out of the gate because it's you read the synopsis you go in you have a certain expectation and that opening scene is not at all what you would be expecting going into that movie um it is a good recommendation and, and i gotta say sarah as someone who is a diehard horror fan you are the, the queen of horror you gotta if you can watch some of these horror films you can sit through requiem for a dream i certainly would um urge you to do it over the holidays it's the it's the best way to have a happy holiday is to watch darren aronofsky's darkest movie ever anyways i i'm gonna go in a totally different direction i do want to have one more film that i want to recommend um that is uplifting that is genuinely you know fun that is not gonna make you depressed it's not gonna be too heavy um it is a wonderful wonderful piece called harry chapin when in doubt do something it is about the jewish award-winning songwriter harry chapin who you may not have heard of but you've certainly heard his music cats in the cradle Taxi. He was um, a great songwriter, great storyteller, also very, very active in humanitarian work. So this film sort of documents um, his journey, his rise to fame, his death. Um, the 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 famous musicians who find their way into this movie is like a who's who: Billy Joel, Pete Seeger, Pat Benatar, Bruce Springsteen, so many more. It's a great documentary. It's um, if you like music, if you like phenomenal um, creative figures and the stories of their lives. Um, and if you just like to see famous people talk about what inspires them, this is a movie that is for you and it is out on Blu-ray and DVD. So I really cannot recommend it enough. And I'm joking about Requiem for a Dream because it's not, it's not a film that's going to uplift your holidays, but I'm not joking about Harry Chapin. When in doubt, do something. It is genuinely a film that will make you smile. Um, and I recommend it highly. If you don't watch it before Christmas or Hanukkah, certainly watch it before the New Year's because it's a great way to celebrate. And the one thing I think we need more than anything else at the end of 2020 is some celebration. So Harry Chapin, when in doubt, do something. Well, those were the particular films that are new to VOD and Blu-ray and DVD these past couple of months. Those are just the ones that stood out to us, but there are a ton more that you can find on the actual articles, the What to Watch features from October and November, which can be found at our website, ajff.org. Please go check out the features Maybe you'll find some other films that you might want to watch um, this holiday weekend besides the ones that Brad and I highlighted here. So again, AJFF.org. And we'll also put that into the show notes as always. So you can go um, find some more recommendations. But now, um, and maybe this will give you even more ideas of what you might want to um, what you might want to watch to occupy your time this holiday weekend. Brad and I have prepared a couple of personal picks for Jewish film and TV moments that we are thankful for from 2020. And I'm just going to dive right into mine. I am thankful for Schitt's Creek sweeping the comedy category at the Emmys. Um, it broke records. That's the first film, uh, excuse me, the first TV show to ever in either category, drama or, or comedy, it's the first series to ever do what it did. It swept. It got every single win. It got every single um, award that it was nominated for. The full cast, um, all the, the writing, everything. And it was so deserved. Um, I think if there was ever a, a TV show, especially in a year like 2020, this, this show really 
found its audience on Netflix this year. Uh, I think it's the feel good show of the year for people to have binged during these weird times. I know that that's how I got introduced to the show. It's got Eugene Levy, Dan Levy, his son. Um, it's, I'm just so happy for that whole cast and all of the people behind that show. Um, again, so well deserved. And if you want to hear more about how it's Jewish, because I think some people still might not know exactly where the Jewish content comes in besides, um, its leads being Jewish. You could always listen to our, um, our episode on uh, Jewish film and TV that we did uh, around the time that the Emmy nominations actually came out. And this was such a great year for Jewish, uh, Jewish television in particular. There were so many Emmy Award nominations that came out for Jewish uh, TV programs, um, things like Unorthodox. So honorable mention there, that one for best director of a limited series. And um, just my last quick honorable mention regarding the Emmys, Maya Rudolph, who is actually half Jewish, uh, she won her first Emmy ever for her guest appearances as Kamala Harris, our new vice president-elect um, on Saturday Night Live. And she actually beat herself. She was nominated twice in the same category as a guest in a comedy. So I'm thankful for Jewish TV shows winning all the Emmys, but especially Schitt's Creek. The Emmys uh, were interesting this year. I don't know. I mean, I'm thankful that we had awards. I'm thankful that we had little moments of celebration. What did you think of the actual Emmy telecast and how they pulled it off? I loved it. I thought, I mean, you kind of have to just embrace the strangeness of this time. And I think having Jimmy Kimmel as host, having these weird moments of, oh, look, there's someone presenting the award in a full hazmat suit that kind of looks like a tuxedo. Like, I think just, I think you can't pretend things are business as usual this year. And I think awards shows that tried to adapt while also trying to hang on to the spirit of whatever that awards show was without really acknowledging like things are not normal. We need to evolve and be creative and, and kind of, you know, have some fun with the format. I think, I think they did a fantastic job. And I know the Schitt's Creek cast in particular, and I encourage people to go watch the acceptance speeches and everything online. But I I read that they sort of all got, they quarantined and did COVID tests and they were able to have like this really nice little gathering that was just for the cast and crew of Schitt's Creek to have this mini little banquet together, um, which I just thought was really sweet. And the pictures were fantastic. They were, you know, taking photos together in masks. Um, yeah, so I think it was, it was weird. It was a weird awards show, but you kind of had to just embrace and accept that it was going to be a little weird, but I think they really pulled it off. They should give an Emmy to the costume designers of the hazmat suits for the Emmys. I think, I don't know if that's possible. That seems sort of mind bending, but they, that was an interesting touch. Cause when I first, someone told me, they were like, oh, they're going to have hazmat suits. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> just like the first time I heard it I was like you got to be joking but they act but it actually worked in a very strange way and uh and I appreciated that I also thought when I saw the Schitt's Creek sort of party uh I was like thank god they're winning because it would be so awkward if they had done all that and then they lost all the categories that they were nominated in um it was it was a beautiful thing it was I have no idea what's going to happen with the Oscars. I have no idea what's going to happen with all of the award shows that typically are happening right around now and leading up into the February uh, period. But if they have some of that spirit of the Emmys, I think we'll be okay. Um, definitely agree. It's also shocking to me that Maya Rudolph has not won an Emmy award. I um, know. I was equally shocked. And honestly, as much as I am a huge Saturday Night Live fan, um, I the other show that I binge watched during quarantine was the good place and i believe that was the other category that was the other role she was nominated for within the same category so as much as i am so excited to see her kamala impression on snl these next few years um and she's great at it i i almost kind of wanted her to win for her role as the judge on the good place but i'm just happy she won and i i'm not sure how many listeners do or don't know that she's actually half jewish but i wanted to really throw that in there because she's a legend Yes, she is absolutely one of the great biracial, half-Jewish comedians in Hollywood that I love very much. Um, all right, so you're thankful for the Emmys, particularly for Schitt's Creek. 
very good things to be thankful for. I am thankful for something uh, that is some, probably somewhat predictable for regular listeners of the podcast. I am thankful for the return of Aaron Sorkin. Um, we recorded an episode all about Aaron Sorkin not that long ago. We talked to Eli Addy, um, who was a, a, a writer and producer on The West Wing the the West Wing cast came back together this year. They had a wonderful, wonderful um, reunion that was it was a staged reading at the uh, I think the Orpheum Theater in downtown Los Angeles of an episode of the West Wing, um, and it was beautiful. It was just I, when we recorded that episode, we had not I had not had a chance to see it yet. Um, and then the trial of the Chicago Seven, which Aaron Sorkin directed. Um, also has come out since that episode. So I hadn't had a really chance to sort of see the return of Aaron Sorkin. I have now. It is, it is great. Um, I, I don't, uh, I don't know how to feel <laughs> going into that West Wing reunion piece. I was a little torn because I loved it. Um, it, I loved the West Wing. I loved that episode. I loved seeing the actors again, but it was also, you know, weird. You you get you take an episode that you have seen before, um, Hartsfield's Landing, and they and they 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 perform it, but they're on a stage, so it's not like a TV show. And you're watching the cast kind of go through, and and you're seeing very theatrical transitions between scenes. Um, it opens um, for anyone who's ever seen that episode of The West Wing before. It opens with the president coming down the steps of Air Force One, and then he's talking to the press, and then. C.J. Craig, the press secretary, is on the phone with the White House chief of staff who's back at the White House. And then the president walks to a car, gets in the car, is on the phone with the White House chief of staff who's still back at the White House. And they manage to stay, you know, they, they do a brilliant job of staging all of those transitions within one scene, moving from the staircase to the press pool to the, you know, to the scene in the office back at the White House to the car. And it's brilliant. And it's wonderfully done. And all of the performances are great. But it's also weird because you're seeing these actors 20 years later. They've all gotten older. Um, their performances are very different from the performances that they gave when they first shot these episodes. And I still remember very vividly the episode. Um, and so it's like it's a weird dissonance when you're watching it. Um, and then, the, of course, the most bittersweet part was um, the actor who played Leo McGarry, White House chief of staff, unfortunately, um, died at the end of the series right during the final season. So he's obviously not around to play that part. So they got Sterling K. Brown to play it. And, and, and that's the only thing I'll say is it was so jarring to watch him play Leo McGarry. And the reason why is he plays the character very differently than the original actor, um, just very differently. And, and it, it sort of amplified that dissonance for me. Um, and of course he's younger I and mean, it's just, you look at him and then you look at like all of these actors who have now gotten very gray haired, um, in the ensuing years. And it's just a little weird, but with all of those things sort of working against it, it still worked phenomenally well. I was really pleasantly surprised because I was worried that it wouldn't. And it just did, um, kudos go to Bradley Whitford, who I think more than any of the other actors really channeled his character perfectly. It was like he had never left the set. He was just, he was Josh Lyman and, um, and just, just phenomenal, phenomenal. It was all for a good cause. It was all to try to support voting, um, and encourage people to vote and raise money for a nonprofit. Um, we all vote that, that it, that goes towards in, encouraging voting, regardless of party affiliation. It's it, it, it's all for a good cause and it was all really great. And I really cannot encourage people enough to go and watch it. You have to have HBO Max to watch it. Um, it is worth it. It is worth getting HBO Max, which can be confusing because HBO Max's rollout has been a little confusing. But if you can if you can find your way to the West Wing reunion special, you should. It is it will warm your heart. And if nothing else, after. Four, four, four years of, of political chaos and, uh, and and a year of just absolute um, shit show uh, to be able to sort of envision, even if it's fictional, a sort of competent working White House full of idealists who are trying to do the best for the people um, is a nice is a nice pause. But that wasn't the only thing Aaron Sorkin did. He also did The Trial of Chicago 7, also a film that I recommend really, really good. I mean, it, you got to you gotta like Aaron Sorkin. You got to like courtroom drama. Um, if you don't love those things, then it might not be your cup of tea. But I love both of those things. And the performances in it are great. Um, Sasha Baron Cohen should get nominated for uh, an Academy Award 
frankly. Um, I don't know that he will, but he should um, because he's channeling Abby Hoffman perfectly. Um, and he he's a phenomenal performer and in, in, in really, frankly, a great actor. But, you know, Frank Langella gives a great performance. Um, the cast is all star. And I really can't recommend that film enough either. But, you know, it was nice to go through 2020 and then get to the end of the year and get a double dose of arguably my favorite screenwriter of all time, Aaron Sorkin. So I, I am hugely thankful. Thank you, Aaron Sorkin. Thank you, the cast of The West Wing. Thank you to the cast of The Trial of Chicago 7. Thank you to Steven Spielberg for not taking that film and directing it before Aaron Sorkin get a chance to do it. I'm very thankful. Thank you, Aaron Sorkin. I mean, I think that this is my time to catch up on Aaron Sorkin because honestly, as much as the social network, again, regular listeners of this podcast might know this because we talked about it in our first episode. And I know we're calling back a lot of previous episodes, but kind of fitting because we're nearing the end of the year. But um, I love The Social Network, uh, which was written by Aaron Sorkin. And that is kind of the extent of my Aaron Sorkin knowledge. Um, I've never watched The West Wing. I do intend to watch uh, The Trial of Chicago 7, though. And this is actually, Brad, where our picks kind of um, overlap and intersect a little bit because you mentioned being thankful for the cast of The Trial of Chicago 7. And Sasha Baron Cohen, who, yeah, may or may not get some awards love, but not just for Trial of Chicago 7, I have been hearing, but also for my number two pick of things I'm thankful for in the world of Jewish film and TV, uh, which is the return of Sasha Baron Cohen as Borat in Borat's subsequent movie film, a movie which I was stubborn about watching because I don't know that the first Borat movie is something that many people could say they're ambivalent about, but I was a bit ambivalent about it. I'd seen it a long time ago. I thought it was fine. It was never, I'm a fan of Sasha Baron Cohen though. And, and I, I think his brand of comedy, just going into these real spaces as these insane erratic characters, you don't see that a lot anymore. I don't know if you ever really did. I, I'm trying to think of examples off the top of my head, but it's so unique and it's so it's so potent. It's it's living, breathing social commentary through comedy. It's living, breathing satire. Um, and I think he does it masterfully. So so I don't know. When I heard there was going to be a Borat sequel, I, I wasn't sure whether I was going to watch it, whether I was going to enjoy it. I watched it. I loved it. I think it expanded on what made the first one such a classic and I think it really rooted again this kind of social commentary it rooted it in a time and place where similar to what you were saying Brad about you know why we kind of needed the West Wing reunion in a way this year and during this political climate this film was I could point to it and say this is why I care about comedy this is why I think comedy is important as a tool to grapple with things and reveal and expose things about our society that are problematic and uncomfortable. And I was uncomfortable a lot during this movie, but it I was also laughing a lot. Um, I'm sure many people by now have heard some of the things that have come out of that movie um, without having watched it, but I do encourage everyone to watch it. If you're okay with his brand of cringe comedy i mean he he is just in top form as borat again and it just works so well in the current climate i loved it and specifically you know obviously sasha baron cohen is jewish but i do just want to highlight that the the way the film grapples with a lot of issues but specifically anti-semitism there is a scene in um that takes place with two women. I think they're both Holocaust survivors. I know one is that he deals with. And if you know anything about the character of Borat, you can already kind of feel yourself cringing maybe a little bit at what that interaction was like. But I assure you it is, it, it's so good. That scene was probably my favorite. I read afterwards that unlike many of his unwilling participants, they were kind of filled in. So it makes it, go down a little bit easier and you can kind of just let the commentary wash over you um, a little bit easier. Um, anyway, I, I love Sasha Baron Cohen. I loved 
Borat, the sequel, better than the first Borat. So I am thankful for him specifically and for this movie. I haven't watched the sequel yet. I, I, it's on my list. I promise I will get to it. Uh, it's interesting because he was, when he first hit the scene stateside um, with Borat, um, he had done stuff prior to that. But when he sort of did Borat, he was um, compared to Charlie Kaufman, who I think is the only other one you can point to as being this kind of weird performance artist. But I just, I always thought that comparison was a little off point because he's, he's smarter than that. His, his humor is so much more incisive. Um, and I remember watching Borat and going, yes, this is hilarious, but clearly this is a guy who has a point of view and is using comedy as a vehicle to try to get that across and lampoon, um, certain things about American culture in particular. And he does it really, really well. Um, so I'm really happy that he's, he's come back to it. Arguably, there has never been a better time for him to, to dust Borat off and, and bring him into the, into the public square and, and just poke fun at America. Certainly, we deserve it after um, the past year, frankly, the past few years. Um, it's interesting, too, because he has not been as successful with his sort of post-Borat um, characters, if you will. Uh, they just they haven't landed for whatever reason. The comedy chops I, I think have always been there but you know i'm with you I, I i i'm a big fan of him um i just haven't gotten around to watching the sequel yet i've been busy um so i'm feeling a little sad that i haven't done that because you're recommend i mean i just sort of went into it saying well it'd be funny but your recommendation is really making me um kind of salivate at the chance to 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 enjoy it but also you know be an educated is the wrong word but to, to get that kind of intellectual um satire is, is something i always gravitate towards so Thank you for the recommendation, Sarah. I appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, just before you get to your last your last pick, which I'm excited to hear about, I just wanted to say that you use the word incisive, which is the perfect um the it's the it's the perfect word. I mean, yeah, the lampooning. It I just want to assure you again, it is it is both hilarious and you'll come away thinking, which I again that's my perfect definition of of successful comedy especially the the brand of comedy that he's bringing and charlie kaufman that's a yeah that is a good um it's it's the best comparison i think we could make but anyway yeah so we're at subsequent movie film brad what is your second pick my uh second pick is a little self-serving i will admit um but i i Looking back over the year, I'm trying to sort of think about what I was most thankful about. I couldn't help but go all the way back to the to the first couple months of the year and when we put together the 2020 festival, um, which was a big milestone for the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival. And we were all very excited about it. And we just got really lucky that we were able to, to pull it off right before the pandemic hit. Um, if we had been a week later, maybe two weeks later... Um, we would, that would not have happened. We would have been, it would have been a disaster. Um, but we just could have got lucky. We'd, we'd heard about coronavirus. We, we actually had some merchandise that we were producing for the 20th anniversary that got stuck in China because of the coronavirus. So like we were aware there was this pandemic, but it hadn't quite hit America yet. We, people hadn't shut everything down and we just just got in under the wire and I just look back and go, oh my God, I'm so thankful that we did because I've watched other festivals, um, people that we are friends with, colleagues um, at other festivals that have had to cancel their festivals outright or scramble and nearly kill themselves to try to get a virtual version off the ground. Um, and and I my heart has gone out to every one of them because it's always a challenge to put a festival on under normal circumstances. And this year, um, it has been a, it has been just terrific. Um, so I'm really thankful that we were able to get the 2020 festival off the ground. I am also thankful that we've had almost a year to prepare um, for the 2021 festival because it won't be a normal festival either. We're still in the middle of the pandemic, but we just got really lucky with the timing. Also, very personally, because we've had all these virtual festivals, I've been able to actually attend more film festivals in 2020 than I think I've ever attended in a given year ever before because so many of them are just are virtual. I was able to go to the Toronto Film Festival without having to fly to Canada and get a hotel room and deal with all that stuff. I was able to watch a bunch of stuff at Toronto. There have been so many festivals that I've just been able to, to experience from my living room, um, which is weird on a certain level, but... Um, but also nice on a certain level because it's really opened up access um, to these festivals in a way that is frankly hard. One of the things that 
people forget, I think, about film festivals is just how expensive it can be to go to them. Um, the travel costs alone are obviously not uh, uh, not 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 small, but you know to get badges and passes to these festivals can also be pretty expensive uh, in a lot of cases. And, you know, you have to commit yourself to the time and, and, and there, and when you go to them, very typically it's a, it's, it's wonderful and you're having a lot of fun, but it's a bit of a slog because you're getting up and you're watching, you know, two, three, four films a day. You're, you're inside of a theater for 10, 12 hours a day. Um, it, you know, it's not like, it's not like a, a vacation at a resort in, in the Caribbean, um, so it, 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 it takes a lot out of you. Um, and it's, and I want, and I love it, but it, it, it is not the most accessible, um, thing in the world, but now it really is much more accessible. So I'm actually very thankful, um, for all of those aspects of 2020, even though it's been really hard for the industry, it's been hard for a lot of our friends. Um, but I'm also, it makes me very excited and I'm looking forward to the 2021 version of the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival because that same accessibility, that same um, energy, uh, even though it's weird, even though it's a little bit different, it still has a certain energy to it of a virtual festival is something we're looking forward to, we're planning for. Um, it's just, I think, really important. Um, and I always say this every year, nothing is all good and nothing is all bad. And so when things are happening that make it feel really hard and really tough, to just remind ourselves that there is some aspect of this that is a silver lining. There is some aspect of this pandemic that is not bad. And, you know, for me, one of those silver linings was being able to sort of take part in all of these festivals, virtually see films that I wouldn't necessarily have been able to see um, or, you know, see as quickly as I saw them or see at all. I'm thankful for that. Um, and I'm trying to, to, to be positive about that. Um, that's what I am probably the most thankful for when I look back on the the Jewish film and television year of 2020. I don't know about you, Sarah. No, I totally agree. I often think a little bit, um, it's always a little bit bittersweet to think back to this past year's AJFF, but I think it, it there's, there's always hope, you know, that we will all be able to gather that way again. And while we maybe cannot, we have, as you said, these silver linings, it was a similar situation for me. I got to watch a film at Fantastic Fest, which is a festival I've always wanted to go to in Texas. And I've never been to Texas and I don't know when I would have gotten the opportunity to go for all the reasons you mentioned. So I think that is an amazing thing to be thankful for and an amazing pick to end with. Yes. And we have a lot to look forward to because like I said, the 2021 AJFF is coming down the pike. We're going to start announcing films. We're going to start announcing a lot of details about that. It will be somewhat virtual affair, um, predictably. Uh, so a lot to look forward to, also a lot to be thankful for. Until next time, we are your hosts, Sarah Glassberg. And Brad Pilcher. Also producing is Chris Holland, who is also our technical director and editor. Thank you again to AJFF Communications Manager Leah Sitkoff for curating the monthly What to Watch feature, which you can find at AJFF.org, and which we'll continue to cover on this podcast in a special segment every month. And who, of course, provides the music you've been humming to all show long. It is Joe Alterman. Please look him up wherever you get your music. You can always find more from us as well as show notes at ajff.org slash in conversation. Our email address is in conversation at ajff.org. Drop us a line with questions and we just might answer in future episodes. Do not forget to subscribe in your podcast app of choice or check out our YouTube channel for new episodes. Give us a rating, a review. Every little bit helps. We should also mention that we cannot continue to do this podcast or any of our other digital programs without your support. If you're willing and if you're able, please make a donation at ajff.org slash in conversation. And of course, please tell your friends about the show. Until next time, goodbye.